All right, so it's two o'clock and uh, I'd like to welcome everybody that's on the call. I'm sure there will be uh, more joining us, but this is Sarah Kudalakos in Toronto. I've got a team here with me and uh, right now we have, I guess, about 30 people on the phone. It, uh, uh, it'll go up from there. And we have Danielle Goldfarb um, in another part of the city on the phone. Danielle, um, let's make sure we can hear you. Good, morning. good afternoon, everybody. Very good. Okay, so I'll just do a few introductory remarks. Um, we're really pleased to be able to do uh, this virtual event on a subject that is clearly of interest to so many of our members. And we've got people on the phone right uh, from all across Canada. And I think a couple of people are even calling in in the middle of the night from China. Um, so we'll try hard to keep you awake. Um, and what we're going to do is Danielle is going to uh, give her presentation and then we'll have a Q&A afterward. Everybody is muted uh, except for Danielle who's speaking and me when I'm moderating and we'll take all of the questions via chat. And so all of you should be able to find the chat function uh, if you hover your cursor down near the bottom of the screen. When you want to send a chat, uh, you can send either to everyone or private. And so please send the questions to, uh, to me. So you'll be able to see Sarah here somewhere. Uh, you should be able to find me on the list. Um, and if you can't find me, it's okay, send it to everyone. Uh, but I'll be sorting through the questions um, and uh, asking them to Danielle in the time that we have after her presentation. So we're really pleased that Danielle Goldfarb has joined us from Rewe Corporation. She's the Global Director of Research and we first met Danielle a few years back when she did a piece of research for the conference board on what makes SMEs successful or not when they go into emerging markets. And it's still a study that I quote uh, to this day, with some very good work. And uh, at Rewe, Danielle has access to some very interesting data um, that allows us to really understand more about China. So I'll turn it over to Danielle. Great, can everybody hear me okay? Okay, so um, thank you so much for, uh, for having me, Sarah, and I'm uh, pleased to be speaking to you today. Here we are amidst the outbreak, um, and it is very, very difficult to know uh, what's, what the true impact of this outbreak will be. How bad is it going to be? How quickly will China recover? And what I'm gonna to talk to you a bit about today is how do we just, you know, how do we distinguish between what's noise, what's hype, what's propaganda, and how do we determine uh, what's the true signal of what's coming out? And um, we, there's just a lot of information flowing, except we don't have access yet to some of the official data to know what's truly happening. And then even when that official economic data comes out, uh, it's, not, it's not clear how reliable that data are. So um, what I'm going to do today is provide you with a bit of a different perspective. And uh, I'm going to share with you some unique uh, high-frequency indicators. So they're data we're gathering on a daily basis. Uh, that uses a new tech, a unique technology. And some of the results that I'm gonna show you, some of the, the, the data that I'm gonna show you is going to confirm what you're reading in, uh, in the news or on social media, maybe you know, in the Globe and Mail or, or uh, other media or on, on Twitter. Um, some of it may actually not confirm <laughs> uh, some of the narratives that are out there um, because we're using a unique technology that is trying to get access to what the broadest set of uh, respondents in China thinks and uh, thinks about a particular issue. So let me explain a little bit about, um, let me move this on, okay. So let me explain a little bit about, let me actually first start with some good news, which is uh, this piece of data that we're looking at right now. Okay, so we asked here, and this is over 13,000 uh, unique Chinese respondents, uh, representative of the online population in China, um, we asked them over the past month, just a couple started starting a couple days after the outbreak uh, became uh, public, and we asked them, you know, is it going to get better or worse? And so we actually found that people, right from you know the, the period right after the outbreak was announced and some of the uh, quarantine the quarantine measures and others were taken, that actually you know there was quite a bit of confidence um, that you know, people people were still very very optimistic. And you can see that uh, this, you know, we, it never really dips below 86%. Um, and then what is happening now in the last week? We're actually seeing that confidence is increasing. 
Uh, so there is, you know, and we know that some of the numbers coming out uh, in from China in terms of the outbreak um, a situation becoming, you know, things becoming better uh, on the public health side. And we're seeing that that is confirmed in some of people's views about the optimism, you know, the, their views about how optimistic they are. Uh, so I think this is a bit of good news. Of course, we know that the, um, uh, we know that things are, um, the pandemic is spreading to other parts of the, the world. Um, and we know that there's, you know, a whole range of impacts we need to consider. But when we're looking at China specifically, this is just one indicator of uh, what, what people are actually thinking and feeling. And I'm going to show you some more, uh, but I just wanted to start with that piece of kind of, you know, good news about, about what's happening. Um, now, I want to just explain a little bit about how we get these data, because it's different than any other data that you're going to see. And essentially, the technology that I'm going to be uh, drawing these data from was created actually during the time of the SARS pandemic. Um, and at its core, it, so the, the technology was originally created to be able to, uh, to do pandemic surveillance. And so it's very appropriate that we're now applying it. We've you know, applied it in the years since to Ebola and Zika outbreaks and so on. And now we're applying it uh, to the situation um, with the COVID-19 outbreak. At its core, the technology has a very simple idea. Can we get access? How do we get access to the widest possible, broadest, most diverse set of respondents? Because that's going to give us access to the most reliable, accurate data. So the whole concept behind the technology was that you know, any, anyone online has an equal chance of being randomly exposed to the questions we're asking. And as a result, we're getting access to a much broader base of respondents. Uh, and then the other thing that's really, really important, particularly in China, is that the data is collected anonymously. So we don't collect any contact information, any email addresses, any names, any kind of information that can get people, uh, can identify people. And this is very, very different than other uh, opinion or behavioral data that's collected in China. Um, and, and it's collected at any time of the day on any device. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about what we're seeing in China, but we are also active in every other country of the world where there's internet access. Um, and the data also is continuous. So we're getting it in, in near real time uh, on a continuous basis. We're not waiting to the end of the month to kind of see what things look like uh, as you have to do in, in, with when you're depending on uh, official data. So that's kind of the essential, the essence of the technology. Uh, we're a Canadian company um, collecting these data feeds and data streams in every, every country of the world. And, um, and what I'm going to show you here is sort of how it, what, what our respondents look like. So basically, because we use this technology that expands the, the, the potential um, uh, respondent set to anyone surfing online uh, in, in China, what we find is we're getting access to people who are not typically included in other, other forms of data collection. So uh, over 60% you know, 60, over 60 of our respondents in China have never answered a survey before, and the vast majority ha are infrequent survey uh, responders. So we're getting access to really what the majority thinks. We're also getting access predominantly to urban respondents, but also to rural respondents. So this is anybody that is online. Um, so other data you might see out there looks at the key urban set, just looks at the sort of top urban centers we would be um, uh, getting respondents from all the urban centers in addition to rural areas as well, uh, at least anybody that's online or has a smartphone. And then this just shows you what, you know, when you see the data, you'll understand that this is, again, this is the, the breakdown of the data by region uh, of China. So we're getting national data, but it's, it's um, distributed. Uh, it looks like a population of map, a population map. Uh, of the country without us doing any waiting or anything like that. This is what the natural breakdown is. This is over the first year of the trade war when we spoke to 80,000 respondents. So that's just to give you some background of what you're going to see and how to interpret the data that you see ahead. Okay, so getting to the question that, uh, that Sarah and I promised we would, we would uh, oh, sorry, one more, one more quick thing, which is to say that um, when, uh, when we're looking at these data, when we're using this approach and this technology, what we found is it's actually quite predictive. Because we're getting access to this broad range of, of uh, respondents, what we're, we're finding is it's very predictive, both in terms of predicting elections. So we were one of the few companies that predicted that Trump would win in 2016 in the US election. Um, we've been very predictive of other uh, economic data in the US. And we're also seeing now, and this is just a new study that's just out, showing that we're actually able, uh, using the RIWI data, to out-predict uh, the Reuters poll, 
uh, for a key Chinese um, headline economic indicator, the monthly manufacturing purchasing managers index. And even when we use data from the from that was only gathered until mid month, we still are this this uh, model or using really uh, employment data is actually predictive of the headline in, uh, indicator. So that's all to say that we're using this technology, we're using a new approach, and I'm going to share with you a bit about what we're seeing. Okay, so here's the question. Everybody knows that the economic impact is going to be negative of this uh, outbreak. Um, and I'm going to focus here on the impact in China. So not, you know, there's many supply chain impacts. Um, there's many global, global impacts. But our, my main focus for this discussion, uh, and we can talk in the discussion about the global impacts, but I'm going to focus on China and the, the Chinese economy. So everybody knows there's going to be a negative impact, but if you see some of the estimates of the, of the impact out there, they're very wide ranging. There's a lot of uncertainty. And the key question is, you know, how, wide, you know, how widespread is this going to be? How long is it going to last? How deep is the, uh, the negative impact going to be? And uh, I'm not sure if I can give you a conclusive answer on this, but I'm going to give you some data that, that can shed some light on this question. Okay, so a lot of what people are looking at right now are these kinds of indicators. So we don't have the official data yet. Um, we're reliant on sort of news, you know, news reporting and some high frequency uh, indicators on things like coal consumption, traffic and so on. So you can see here that, you know, that, um, uh, that this is not really data, but from, from these other data that uh, coal consumption is, um, has, you know, is, is, is uh, you know, there is a negative impact. Um, it's not nearly where it was at this time uh, in previous years. Now, this only tells you part of the story. Um, that it tells you that you know people haven't gone fully back to work, but we don't really know whether some of this is mitigated by the use of remote working, um, and we don't really know what demand looks like. So, are people you know do people still want to go? But you know, do people still feel confident about um, their economic prospects? And so that's what I'm going to show you some data on uh, from Riwi to start. So here's what we see. Okay, so this is the share reporting. It's a good time for them to make a major purchase. Uh, like a car. So in, um, in January, the beginning of January, before the outbreak happened, so we're at about 42%, I think it's a good time to make a major purchase. Then the outbreak happens, okay, we're still sort of in a similar zone, but we can see that there is a decline in confidence, as one would expect. Um, and so, you know, there is a significant, you know, notable decline in confidence, and this is, these are data as of yesterday morning from about 14,000 uh, people over the course of the last um, month and a half. Um, so yes, there has been a significant, you know, there has been a down, downturn in sent consumer sentiment as one would expect, but let's put it in a, a larger context. So this is data that's from March of last year, so almost a year ago, and you can kind of see, so this is throughout the trade war period, um, you know, goes up and goes down, and it's gone down, but you know, in from January to February, but it's not, you know, it's not a, a massive drop off the cliff there. So, you know, just to put it into some context, it's not that different from where we were at about a year ago in terms of uh, confidence from the consumer side. Now, how does, how does this um, compare to before the outbreak in China uh, to after the outbreak? So here we have data from, um, the month before the outbreak to the month after the outbreak. And in China, uh, excluding Hubei province, we have about 42% who think it's a good time to make a major purchase um, compared to about 40% in Hubei. And we just, I should also mention that um, we naturally collect data from Hubei because we're collecting this natural, this, this national data and um, it, it contains respondents from Hubei. But in the wake of the outbreak, we've actually doubled up on our data collection. So we're geo-targeting extra data collection in Hubei province to understand the degree to which things are, um, you know, localized versus more widespread. And so here's what we find post outbreak. Um, so it, you know, confidence has gone down a lot at the national level, you know, a little bit at the national level, um, but in Hubei, but it's gone down by more. So this is kind of as one would expect, but I think we would be more worried if, um, if throughout China, we saw numbers similar to Hubei and we're seeing that they are, uh, they are different. So that's, uh, that's giving you a bit of um, the, the regional perspective. Uh, I'm going to dig in a little bit more to the different parts of China. Um, so here, this is the percent change from the pre-outbreak period to the post-outbreak period. Um, and we've got this data going back a long way, so this is just a bit of a snapshot. 
Um, so we're seeing that, you know, uh, as you would expect, you know, that there's larger increase in the, in the Bay, but then across the country, it does actually vary by region. And we have these data also on a much more granular level as well. Okay. So what about businesses? Um, one of the things that we don't know is whether businesses are starting to feel, uh, feel the pinch of this, it's affecting their planning. Um, and so uh, we have started gathering business sentiment in October before the outbreak. And we asked people, um, do you plan to expand, um, which means hire more workers, buy new equipment, or do you expect, you expect to make no, no, you know, make no changes, or do you expect to shrink? And so this is what we saw in October. Uh, basically, most, most businesses were fairly optimistic, even despite you know, the, the trade war and the many other challenges um, in China um, before the outbreak. Um, and we saw that also um, continue uh, to be even more positive just before uh, the outbreak hits. And then after the outbreak hits, we see a drop off here. So, um, you know, fewer people expect to expand and more people, more businesses expect to shrink. Now, I should just qualify this by saying that these are not the state owned enterprises. These are private uh, businesses, smaller businesses. And uh, so we will continue to track that in the, the months and weeks ahead um, to see whether that worsens or whether that stays the same. And one, one important thing to note about all of these sentiment indicators is that they can change rapidly. So um, this is why you know, one of the things we're doing is we're tracking these things on a continuous basis to be able to put them in, this, you know, in, this, in the larger context. And you know, when an event does happen, um, so if something happens in the next week or two, uh, so we now, you know, we know the government, for example, is going to it has introduced some stimulus, some uh, some measures to to help out smaller businesses. You know, is that going to have an impact um, on their thinking about what their plans are? You know, is that going to have an impact? And if so, uh, we'll be able to capture that in the data over the coming days uh, as our our continuous data feed comes in. So that's sort of a you know a, a little bit of a snapshot on both uh, consumer and business sentiment. Um, next, I'm going to show you again, you know, similar to the first slide I showed you, um, when we looked at people being optimistic about the, uh, about the, you know, the, the situation getting better, we're collecting a lot of um, information about fear related to the outbreak um, and, you know, the degree to which people are worried about it. And so here's what we saw. Um, we saw that in the first, you know, we, we tried, we started tracking this again a couple days after the, um, uh, the outbreak became public. And about 73% uh, were worried about the new, out, the, uh, worried about the outbreak. But then again, around this return to work period, and as the data coming out seemed to, sorry, seemed to have improved, we see a significant improvement um, or lessening of worry or fear about the outbreak. Um, as of uh, yesterday morning. Uh, so again, align with the other trend that people are optimistic and think the situation will get better. Um, fewer people are worried now. And this is um, almost 15,000 people we've asked over the course of the last almost month. Uh, so a very good uh, large, uh, large number of respondents, again, representative of the online population. And we're asking them as they're, we're not capturing any of their personally identifiable information uh, when we ask this, so to at least to minimize the chance of them uh, uh, not telling the truth. And what we're looking for here is a change over time. Okay, so next. Um, Danielle, yeah. Danielle, this is Sarah. We've had a question that I think is worth asking uh, before we end, which is, uh, is there anything simply you can tell us about the demographic of the people that are answering? Sure, yeah, so as I mentioned before, um, uh, the so it's 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 the online it's representative of the online population so it, the, if anything there is bias towards the younger population in China but because we're getting so for example in this data I'm about to share with you uh, we've got about sixteen thousand respondents we would still get a few thousand of those who would be older um, and then it would be you know evenly distributed throughout the other age categories uh, and then we would have more younger people because younger people tend to be online. Uh, so that's the age breakdown. We will also have, um, uh, it'll be weight, more weighted towards male over female because again, the online population in China is uh, more weighted, you know, is, is more heavily male. 
um, and uh, age. And I already showed you the urban rural breakdown. So more urban than rural, but again, including rural, most other data does not include rural. So it sort of looks like it was about two thirds, one third. Um, so that's the, that's the general breakdown. And uh, the, the uh, regional breakdown, as you saw, basically looks like it's mapped to population. Um, so that's, that's, that's a kind of a, a, a quick sense of what it looks like. So hopefully, that, hopefully that answers that question. Um, but we really get people throughout all uh, age categories and it's also evenly distributed throughout the different income categories as well. Um, if the, whoever's inter whoever asked that question, I'd be more than happy to share um, some more detailed data on the, uh, on the breakdown of the respondents. But basically we get people in almost every category, um, um, but it is, you know, it, we, we do tend to get people who are slightly more educated because again, that's the online population. So that's, uh, so that's what our respondents look like. I'd be happy to give more information to you. Um, so here I'm gonna look at the share who are confident in health officials' ability to educate the public on avoiding or treating the new, uh, the, the new coronavirus. And here again, we see quite a bit of confidence. Um, so you know, throughout the period, and again, even um, imp oops, sorry, improving. Uh, over the last week. So the data that we see on these broader confidence measures are quite consistent, um, that people are confident uh, in the handling of the outbreak in, in contrast to some of the stuff that uh, has appeared in media. But the majority of the, the, the major narrative that's emerging from this is that people are confident and their confidence in things improving is growing. This is actually just an interesting comparison um, in China uh, versus Hong Kong uh, versus the US. So, um, you know, a large degree of confidence in China compared with a very different narrative in Hong Kong and also um, in the US. So we're tracking these things, we're tracking things all around the world. Travel, uh, so a big, a big impact. I think a lot of people um, are, you know, there's been huge impacts on travel, global travel. Uh, um, since June 2019, where do you plan to travel next for vacation? And and so what we were we uh, what we see emerging here is within China has. Uh, has gone down quite a bit, uh, well, a couple of percentage points since the outbreak uh, hit. Um, US travel, very consistent, uh, in fact, even improving at various points during the trade war, um, has now gone down by a bit. Canada uh, seems to have lost a little bit of momentum there as well because most people don't plan on traveling. So this is, again, this is probably confirming what everybody already thinks is, is happening. Um, and, but this is just, uh, you know, some, some solid data on how it compares um, uh, to what we saw over the past year. And at the same time, we were, we've been asking, we wanted, you know, does it have an impact on what people think um, about other parts of the world? People um, actually think better of the U.S. now. Um, they consistently think the U.S. is a great place to be. Uh, same thing about Canada seems to have gone up a little bit, um, but Europe has been less favorable. So it hasn't impacted, um, uh, you know, Chinese perception of like, like all of these events have basically not changed um, people's perception, people in China's perceptions about, um, uh, about the, them, themselves and the rest of the world. Although, although, uh, uh, you know, China looks like it's gone up in recent months. Okay. So now looking at some employment data. Um, so one of the things that we looked at, we've, we've um, looked at in addition to sentiment, is we've been continuously gathering employment data in China. And this is the data that is proven to be very predictive of um, headline economic data in China. And what we see here is, um, this is the share of manufacturing employment, uh, that is a share of employees that are employed full time. So, um, in at the start of the trade war, we had 93% employed full time. Uh, you can see that in mid 2019, there was kind of a low point. And then over the course of the rest of 2019, 
in line with what official data have shown, we saw an important um, increase in manufacturing employment and then um, dropping off a little bit in January before the outbreak. Um, but it actually, we actually don't see post outbreak yet a big impact on employment. Now this could be because we are in the midst of sort of this transition back to work period uh, where we know that China is not um, uh, fully back to work. There's many, many constraints on, uh, you know, both in terms of uh, some areas which are still quarantined, uh, difficulties in traveling, um, constraints on business reopening. Um, and so during the, during the extended Lunar New Year break, people were still paid. Um, and so what's going to be really critical is to watch what happens to that number in the next couple of weeks uh, to see whether we see that people now say, oh, well, I was employed full time, but now I'm part time or, um, uh, or something similar. So we're going to be monitoring these very closely in the coming weeks. It's still a bit early to see if there's an impact um, on people's employment status. And this is um, uh, some data that we're gathering. So this is the data that I referred to earlier when I said that RIWI, did, RIWI is predictive of some headline economic data in China. Um, this is the official purchasing managers index, which is a key sort of um, uh, indicator of economic data in China, of economic activity in China. And this is what it looked like um, over the course of, you know, since the beginning of the trade war. Um, this is what Riwi's data looked like. So it's very much in line our, when we, we used employment and wage data to model the, um, uh, the Chinese PMI, manufacturing PMI data, and it's very much in line. Um, we're now tracking that data um, in the wake, you know, in January and February and onwards. Um, and, you know, we, this is very preliminary, this number here um, in the dotted line, because we think it's not yet capturing, or if there is going to be a very, very negative impact on manufacturing, we won't yet see it in our data until, you know, the end of February, beginning of March, when things hopefully start to normalize. So again, we're going to be tracking this and we can track it on a daily basis uh, to see whether that is, whether we're seeing signs of, of deterioration in employment, um, in wages, uh, in manufacturing, uh, but we're also tracking it across other parts of the economy as well, including uh, the tech sector, uh, retail and others. Um, I think also I just wanted to point out uh, that we want to um, uh, you know, we may need to think about the impact of uh, the fact that China is such an, um, the Chinese population is a global outlier in the degree to which it operates online. And this is a survey we did last year, um, which uh, where we can see that um, the majority of activity in China across almost every area takes place online. This is pre-outbreak. And so certainly we know that there's been, you know, anecdotally a lot of increase in, um, in online activities and they may be, um, this may mitigate some of the impact. We know that there's a lot of tech workers that are working remotely. Uh, same thing when we look at the, the share of people who make most of their money from online gig work. So for example, people who drive uh, for uh, ride sharing services or people who sell their data entry services online or people who fill out surveys all day for money. Uh, we know that China is really the global outlier here doing a lot of this, this work. It's a very important part of their economy not reflected in typical labor market statistics. And we also know that they, the Chinese population is engaging in a lot of uh, online services. So this is the share of Chinese who conducted, consulted a doctor online um, to, uh, so more than five times um, in the last six months. And you can see that it's, it's common amongst young people, but also common amongst uh, the older population as well. And it's, pop, it's common, common amongst the rural population, as, you know, urban and rural population. So a lot of activity takes place online and we need to think about the degree to which that might mitigate the, um, the uh, economic impact. Okay, so I've given you a lot of information. <laughs> um, I just wanted to highlight maybe two other, case, two other situations uh, before we wrap up that we have been tracking that um, uh, kind of get back to this question of signal versus noise. So what is, what is truly happening versus what does, you know, what do we hear about in the media or in traditional surveys or in, in uh, on social media? And so one of the things that we were tracking over the course of the trade war 
was this question of whether, um, uh, you know, whether there'd been a backlash against Apple products in the, during the trade war. And a lot of people said that there was, a, you know, that, that uh, people were going to give up their iPhones and give up their, you know, use of American products. Um, and, and, you know, that, that this was sort of a common narrative and people, you know, banks said to drop your Apple stock and so on and so forth. Here's what we saw um, during the, the period of the trade war. We saw that um, Huawei did gain a significant share of people's intentions to purchase more Huawei products, but it came actually at the expense of Chinese brands, other Chinese brands, not really at the expense of Apple. So what, what's happened, so that's sort of, you know, myth versus reality that we, we found that this was not borne out by the data. And then of course, good things happened to Apple stock, stock price. Um, now what's happened since January, we do see that uh, there has been actually a decline in um, uh, intentions to purchase Apple products and an increase in intentions to purchase Huawei products, perhaps because of supply chain difficulties um, in getting access to those phones. Uh, it's not clear at this point, but we will continue to track it. And then the last thing, not at all related to either the trade war or the, um, uh, or the, um, uh, or the outbreak, uh, but related to another issue that emerged uh, this past year, which was the tweet by uh, the Houston general manager um, in support of the Hong Kong protests, which everybody said would be, um, you know, kind of just basically be a disaster for Chinese uh, revenue in the NBA. And we did see actually a dip in support for the rockets in our data in the first couple of days immediately following that and a dip in intentions to watch the NBA. Um, but basically over the course of the last number of months, uh, the rockets line up uh, exactly where they were before the outbreak or in a similar spot to where they were before the outbreak. Um, and um, uh, you know, this was not a longer term issue. So that's, that's basically a summary of kind of some of our latest data on, uh, you know, distinguishing from the, the signal, distinguishing the signal from the noise amidst the outbreak. Um, we are, you know, we're doing this on an ongoing basis. And what we can see is that, you know, things have clearly deteriorated um, on the sentiment front on, in terms of both consumer and business sentiment, but they're not wildly out of the, the deterioration is not wildly out of line with what we saw before the outbreak period. And so, um, what will be really critical is to see what happens in the in the coming uh, days and weeks um, in in the data that we're collecting to try to get a better read of what's truly happening. Um, and I would love to get your thoughts uh, either uh, via this uh, via the chat or um, if you want to contact me at this. I've got my contact information here. Um, if you have any suggestions for what other kinds of signals we should be tracking at Rewe at the moment. Uh, we're, uh, we're very flexible in the sense that we can stick questions in fields very rapidly and get um, immediate, you know, real-time uh, information about what's truly happening. And also just to mention that we will be posting an update on our website uh, with some of the data that you've seen today um, uh, in the course of the next week. So stay tuned for that as well. I'd be happy to take your questions. Well, thank you, Danielle. And uh, I know some of the people have joined be, uh, after we started. There is a chat function on Zoom. If you uh, hover over the bottom of your screen, you'll see that. And uh, we'll take questions, any, any questions that you want to send in via chat, and I will uh, moderate them. So uh, uh, please do uh, send us your, um, your questions. In the meantime, Danielle, why don't I kick off with one which is you asked them about travel. And I saw some Economist Intelligence Unit data last week that said that uh, outbound, tra outbound tourism and travel was not predicted to recover until the second quarter of 2021. Um, your numbers didn't really show that much drop off. Uh, and I'm wondering if you have any thoughts. Sorry, so the data was showing that that it wasn't intended to recover. Can you just repeat that again? The yeah, they were looking at different sectors and, and how long it would take for them to recover. And yeah. travel was the one that was going to take the longest. And the yeah. estimate was second quarter 2021. Yeah. Well, I think, I mean, our data are basically just showing what people's, we just asked them a very general question because our question wasn't designed to ask about specifically about the outbreak. 
um, we've been at, we wanted to basically show it in the historical context of, you know, uh, the, the degree to which people are planning to travel. Um, we, you know, I, I think that people in, in our data, I guess, you know, it's, it's hard to know what the assumptions, and I haven't read that particular study, um, but, you know, it's hard to know how, I think this is the, this is the question. Uh, in people's minds in China, um, I guess they're imagining, according to these data, you know, some of them are still imagining that their travel, their travel next plans are still going to take place. Um, we didn't ask them, you know, have you delayed your travel plans? And I think if we were to ask questions like that, um, we might get a, a more accurate read, um, perhaps lining up with what the economist has said, perhaps not. Um, but, but we're, you know, we're just getting a read there that uh, that sentiment has declined, that, that people are traveling or tend to travel less uh, because of the outbreak. We're getting a clear signal that that's happening. Um, but the, the length of that, I think we need to add more, uh, we need to add more questions that are going to get at that uh, more specifically. I, I'm not sure how The Economist predicts that it's going to take till 2021, uh, but I know people do take a long time to make their travel plans. So uh, people do plan in advance and uh, we can, we can really certainly get at that in more detail um, by asking more questions along those lines. Uh, but that's sort of just a quick, you know, we know people's sentiment has shifted, but it sounds like people have not made, um, uh, you know, their sentiment has shifted, but we don't have enough detail about, you know, when they're gonna take their next trip yet. Okay. Well, at, at this point, we don't have other questions from the audience. Um, Oh, here we go. We're getting a few. Um, what kinds of new questions are you thinking of adding to your follow-up surveys of Chinese netizens in the near future? Well, that's a good question. I would throw it back at those of you who are listening. Um, there, the sky's the limit in terms of the kinds of questions that we could ask. Um, you know, we can do all kinds of things uh, looking into inflation, food inflation, uh, from everything to, you know, unrelated to the outbreak. Um, to tracking much more specific. So we are tracking, I mean, in China, we're tracking hundreds of different indicators at the moment. Some of them have to do with, um, you know, the degree to which, uh, so we're tracking, for example, what, what interest rate do you pay for your business loan, for example? We're trying to understand the degree to which uh, people are, are paying very, very high interest rates. Businesses are paying high interest rates, and that's a very a big financial risk. Uh, we're looking at the degree to which people are, um, uh, intend to take their money out of China versus invest it in China. Um, we, the potential is, you know, we're looking at a whole bunch of um, sector specific questions. We have data on um, uh, employment by sector in China. So we ask people, what sector are you employed in? And we can look at things like wage growth in technology sector versus manufacturing. So there's a lot of different, uh, different data that one could collect. Um, we're, you know, collecting a whole bunch of different things and we are able to, you know, as events unfold, if we think there's a question that, that makes sense, um, we can, we can put it in field pretty rapidly. So I'd love to get, you know, people's ideas or thoughts of what else we should be asking or what we could be asking. Well, here's another one that came in along that line, which is, did really ask about household savings or if people are paid while they are staying at home? So we didn't ask, um, those questions in this particular uh, iteration, we absolutely could ask. We absolutely could ask them. Um, and um, but household savings, we've asked that in other surveys. We haven't asked that in this one. But we could look at the impact of the outbreak on savings. We do know people's incomes, um, and so we do know all these data that I showed you broken down uh, for uh, for sentiment for sorry for people's income and wage levels. And now there's another question. Sorry, go ahead. Um, yeah, so there was another one, um, which is, do you track sentiment toward the environment or more yes. specifically air, water, soil, and wellness? So we also can potentially track sentiment towards the environment. Uh, we have run questions, for example, um, asking people about air quality, you know, uh, we usually have to ask them sort of by using a, a proxy, using a sort of a, a question design that will get at it um, in a unique way. So, you know, uh, how much are you having trouble breathing um, uh, at the moment? Is that worse or better than it was last month? Um, so we can track various different aspects of this. 
um, but not uh, directly. We would be tracking sort of sentiments. And then we could also track um, perspectives on the environment, so support for environmental, um, uh, you know, for certain different environmental measures. So we're, we, we've tracked all kinds of things like, uh, you know, uh, support for self-driving cars and so on. And, and, and we can track sentiment across, you know, any, any number of issue areas. Okay, um, another one that has come in, some of them you can see and some of them only I can see. Okay. Uh, as the outbreak progresses outside of China, like in Italy, how will you track this and, and how it impacts sentiment and trade in China or globally? So we can potentially track this in every, any, part, any part of the world. We've done lots of work in Italy, uh, in other parts of Asia. Um, and um, we can ask these same questions if there's demand to ask those questions uh, in any other part of the world. So, um, uh, you know, I think I showed you here data from China, Hong Kong, and the US. Uh, it's a question of how much interest people have. And, uh, but yeah, certainly there's potential to do that um, when, it came, when it comes to, you know, when it came to Zika and um, Ebola and others, we, we were tracking those. Uh, those situations in the relevant parts of the world. And we can continue to do that as the outbreak uh, continues where there's, there's demand and interest. Our, our focus right now um, has been on, on China because that's, that's, you know, that's where everything started. Um, that's where everything started. But yeah, absolutely. There's potential to track it everywhere using the and technology. Yeah. You showed the sort of confidence in health officials in China being quite high and much higher than respondents in Hong Kong and the US. So one of the question is why, do you have any thoughts as to why that is and what is the rest of the world missing? <laughs> um, what is the rest of the world missing? <laughs> That's an interesting question. <laughs> uh, um, so I think that, um, so is the question about, is the question about um, what is the world missing? Um, what are we missing in terms of the news? Okay, there's two, I guess there's maybe two ways to interpret this question. One is what's the, uh, what is the public missing in terms of, you know, the news, like the outbreak, the sort of the reporting of the situation, which suggests that there's quite a bit of public anger and, um, you know, lack of confidence in public health officials in China, uh, which contrasts to the narrative that we're, uh, that we're seeing. Um, I mean, I think, you know, the situation in Hong Kong uh, I, we can understand, given the protests there and so on, why there's less trust in officials to get things right. Um, and I think there's just generally um, more skepticism about, um, you know, uh, public health. Um, you know, I, you know I, I don't really know. I mean, it's hard for me to say I'm not a public health expert, but I will just, you know, the rest of the world, you know, this varies um, uh, a lot between from country to country. We know this from our work in other um, uh, pandemic uh, outbreaks that trust in officials is not, um, we can't kind of count on it being uniform across countries. And it's really important, I think, to understand that when you're thinking about the best public health measures, the best policy measures to counteract um, uh, outbreaks. They may not be necessarily the same in, in each part of the world. I mean, there's definitely public health measures you need to take, but the messaging around them uh, could be different depending on who people believe and uh, how much they trust the officials and it's the outbreak. Okay, yeah, and I did get clarification. It was really vis-a-vis uh, -vis news and info. But we have a bunch more questions, so I think we'll keep going. Um, have you seen any variation in the level of optimism regarding the virus across provinces? So this is, this is widespread. The level of optimism is pretty widespread across uh, the different regions of the country. I can't tell you offhand, uh, but I can look it up later, um, uh, you know, uh, Hubei specifically. Um, but, you know, we do have that data and generally it's, um, it's generally uh, widespread sentiment. When you say course, similar in, in each province or similar, different? So um, I've just looked at the regional data right now. So I, I, I don't want to say it's similar in every single province. I'll have to go back and look that up. But generally, regionally, it's like between the different regions of the country, uh, it is generally pretty widespread. 
um, uh, and you know, the, when we, we ask the question about awareness of the, of the, uh, about the outbreak and awareness in Hubei province was like 99% from day one, where it was a little bit lower in other parts of the country, but that has, you know, that has crept up over the course of the outbreak. So, you know, we have all that data at a regional and sub-regional level um, to be mined and to be looked into. <laughs> Okay, we've got a couple of questions regarding Chinese sentiments toward Canada as okay. a brand, um, yeah. and uh, either either as a brand or even in the in the face of this crisis. And uh, which countries' support do people appreciate most? So, uh, Chinese sentiments towards Canada as a brand, we haven't tracked that specifically amidst this outbreak. However, um, the data that I showed you about which is the best place to educate, uh, to send your child for post-secondary education. So we've got, we've tracked that data over time. We can tell you, um, you know, in, in, it's consistent across the regions of, uh, across, you know, most regions of China. So it's widespread views um, that it's about, you know, 9% of the population thinks that Canada is the right place to send to educate their children. That's pretty consistent over the entire time we were measuring it. Um, unique respondents every day. So we're not seeing any change in that. We have tracked specific um, sentiment towards, um, for example, uh, Canada Goose. Um, so in the wake of the arrest of the Huawei CFO in, uh, in the, the fall, uh, you know, at the uh, a year or so ago, um, we did ask about, you know, uh, are you aware of a, um, a boycott of Canada Goose? Are you planning to participate in it? And, and numbers were very, very low in terms of participating um, in that kind of boycott. So we know we have some data on that. Uh, we also have data on travel intentions, which I showed you a little bit of. Um, and, uh, but other than that, we haven't asked specifically about Canada, but that doesn't mean that uh, we, we certainly could ask about this. This is certainly something that is within the realm of possibility. Um, those are just the ones that I have data on right now. Okay. Um... There have been some articles saying that companies only have 20 to 40% of their workforce back to work. Do you have any data about that situation or how efforts to resume operations are progressing at this time? Yeah, so I mean, I pointed to some of the, um, the uh, so there's a couple of different ways of looking at this. Um, we know that there's, you know, people, many people in the tech world are now working remotely. Um, and so they're still continuing to work, but obviously in manufacturing, uh, in other sectors, you have to actually be there to do the work. Um, so, you know, there are a number of high frequency indicators that uh, suggest that, um, that this is true, that, you know, that there is, uh, that we are far from resuming full working, uh, full working, normal working situation. Um, in particular, the indicators that suggest this are, you know, I showed the one on coal production as earlier in the deck, but there's also others on air pollution, which is at a fraction of what it, or which is much lower than what it would normally be at this time of year. But then there have been, there has been some data in the last, just yesterday and today, showing that traffic in um, the top, uh, top 10 cities in China has actually shown a marked increase um, in the last few days. So again, this is the kind of thing that we need to kind of really keep an, uh, keep a, uh, keep uh, our eye to to see whether you know those high frequency indicators are changing, and um, uh, you know in, in the coming days, and we'll be looking at that in terms of our employment data. Our employment data are going to show us if um, when people come back to work, they are only working part time, or they're only you know they're being told their hours are being cut back or their wages are being cut back. That's going to show up in our high frequency data um, over the next couple of weeks. Okay. And how do your survey respondents receive the questions online? Okay, so this is the more technical question. Um, so basically the technology is based on this idea that we access, we identify and access at any one time hundreds and thousands of web domains that are parked but inact inactive. And what we do, in, that's it's a machine learning technology that basically tries to get access to the broadest possible set of web domains that um, that represent the full diversity of the online population in China or any, any country. When anybody in China online randomly stumbles across one of these domains, we uh, expose our questions to them. So the whole idea is a random exposure and that anybody has equal chance of, of getting access to. 
So that's really the, how the technology works. I'd be more than happy if people have specific questions about how it works, I'd be more than happy to answer those uh, more technical questions. But the, the basic idea is that we're going out and exposing the questions to anybody who is, uh, who is online. Uh, and sorry, anybody online, online has an equal chance of randomly uh, stumbling across one of these, uh, you, one of these web domains. Even uh, though it's random, you still get like 15,000 people to answer a question. That's interesting. Yeah, and so it's random exposure. And so, yes, but, you know, people can choose to answer or not answer, and they can also choose to drop off at any time. So one really uh, important distinction in the way we gather data and others do is if you are incentivizing respondents, so if you, if you want people to get to the end of the survey um, and you pay them to do that or you, make, you get the, give them coupons or whatever it is, um, they, you have to collect their, their names and contact information. And we don't do that. We don't collect any personally identifiable information so people can drop off. They're not coerced to complete the survey. Um, and this is also a good way of us measuring, you know, the degree to which people care about the topics that we're, we're asking about too. So we have an additional layer of information um, on, on how much people care about a particular topic. And amidst, you know, what we find is during an outbreak situation uh, or during a humanitarian crisis, so, you know, like the, the crisis in Venezuela, for example, right now, uh, where people are leaving the country and so on. When we're, in, we're dealing with a, a situation that's, that's a, you know, of, of more interest to people's everyday lives. Uh, we do get a, a higher degree of engagement. Okay, and then there's one more question, which is what proportion of your respondents are repeat respondents? Okay, so uh, our respondents are unique. Um, they're, so we're not, uh, we're not, so unlike other survey data, traditional survey data, uh, where they go back to the same respondents, the whole idea behind this technology is that our respondents are unique. So every day we're asking respondents, uh, every day we're collecting data, it's from a unique set of respondents um, okay. in China. Yeah. And if they have answered before, you don't know that they have answered before? Well, we have mechanisms in place to ensure that they don't repeat their answer. I mean, in a place right. like, it, it depends which part of the world we're in. If you're, if you're, you know, we're doing work with Syrian refugees in Turkey, and sometimes we have to take extra measures to make sure we're we're not asking the same person twice, but in a place like China, we're not getting, uh, we're getting unique respondents daily. Okay, and then I think we have time for one more. So the question that came in is, would you mind clarifying the data on confidence in public officials? So is this confidence in their own local officials or their confidence in Chinese officials? So, oh, that's a good question. So yes, in each country we asked, to what degree do you have confidence in your own health officials in controlling the outbreak, in taking the appropriate measures to control the outbreak? So in each of these, those questions, so the data on confidence in public officials was, you know, that indicates the Chinese population is very confident in its public officials' uh, ability to handle the outbreak, whereas in Hong Kong and the US, um, the population is much less confident in its own officials uh, managing, uh, managing the outbreak. And that could change if the outbreak, you know, does go to the United States uh, in a more serious way. Right. Okay. Well, you've given us a lot to look at and think about, and we will be sharing this presentation with all who are registered um, for, the, um, for the session. So, Danielle, I would like to thank you very much for sharing your uh, ongoing data with us. It's great to be able to have something that is up to date as of this morning. Um, and certainly if anybody on the phone wants more information about what you do, your contact information is on that last slide and it will be shared. Um, let me also just say to those of you who are on the phone that uh, we uh, at CCBC are in the middle of fielding a survey to understand how business is dealing, not only with the COVID-19 outbreak, but how how your business may have been affected over the last year by things like bilateral tension, US-China trade war, et cetera. And we really hope that everybody will take five minutes and go to that survey. If you haven't gotten the email about it, you can find it right on the homepage at ccbc.com. And uh, we would love to have your input. So uh, with that, I think we'll close. Um, thank you very much to Danielle and to all of you who are on the phone. And uh, uh, feel free to reach out to us for anything that you need regarding this uh, COVID-19 situation or anything related to Canada-China business. Thanks.